day. Um, and again, make sure that you connect with me on social media, Facebook, that is In The Know Radio Magazine Show. And on Twitter, my handle there is ITK Radio Mag Show. So now, sit back, relax, and get rejuvenated right here. We are ready to go into our community affairs segment. And on the lines with me is my guest, author Maddie Rich. He's the author of the book, Bev, based on a book by Meredith Copal. He is my return guest, Maddie. Welcome back to the show. How are you? How are you, Denise? It's good to be back. Uh, just, uh, in, in just enjoying the moment, enjoying the moment of uh, each day. Uh, just promoting the book, Bev, the civil rights book that I Yes. That was recently released, and um, just just having a good time talking to people and sharing stories, and talking about how civil rights, the era, uh, compares to what we're dealing with right now in the country. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Maddie, at the age of nineteen, you gained major recognition as an acclaimed, award-winning writer, director, and producer. Talk to us now about Straight Out of Brooklyn and its significance with Black History Month. Well, you know, Straight Outta Brooklyn was a, a passion project of mine since I was, you know, a teenager. And this was an idea that I remember when I was 17 years old, I uh, sat down with my mom and I said, you know, I, I want to make a film. I've been reading film books, you know, practically all of my young life and mm -hmm. going to the library. My mom has been buying film books, but I never thought that I could actually make a movie, but I had the idea that I wanted to make a uh, so I did all the research and learned what film is all about and what, what learning what writing and directing is about. Mm -hmm. And I just put my, you know, we just, uh, I just started to move. Actually, when you start to move on something, it just starts to unravel into something spectacular. And so I wrote the script, Australia, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I started casting actors. Uh, I did a short clip. Uh, so I could uh, show that to investors. Now, keep in mind, this was a, a film. This wasn't a digital. They didn't have digital cameras back in the 90s. Yeah. So, uh, so this was a 35-millimeter feature film, just like the big professionals did. But I, I, I put a little short clip together that I shot in my grandmother's house in Record Project. And uh, about and the story is about a young African-American boy who... Uh, heard his mom and dad, you know, well, rather his dad beating up on his mom, mm -hmm. and he wanted to uh, get straight out of Brooklyn. He wanted some peace in his house, mm -hmm. but he didn't know how to attain that. So he had this bad idea of robbing a drug dealer with his friends, and I played one of the friends in, in the movie. And uh, so the movie tells you how not to get, you know, how to get out of any situation the right way through education. Uh, through working hard, not trying to get out on the easy side of life, which always turns out to be a wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So that short clip gave me the opportunity to show it into investors, and then investors invested in it, and then we made Straight Outta Brooklyn. Um, and that's and then I met with Jonathan Demi, the director of Silence of the Lamb. Yeah. And he, and he saw my feature film, and he just enjoyed it, and he introduced me to some other like, exec producers, and they brought me to a Robert Redford Film Festival Sundance, which I won at that time, and wow. that's when I, I was 19 when I won that. Yes, yes. Now, that's some really great information that you've shared with us during Black History Month. Um, and tell us a little bit more. I'm looking at your novel here, Bev. Tell us just a little bit more about this book. Well, Bev uh, is, is a story based on the real life of a, a little-known figure in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. A white, a, a white social worker named Bev Luther, who uh, left New York City, uh, the comforts of her home in New York, and so she traveled to the segregated South to to help African Americans achieve equality. And she marched alongside of Dr. King. Yeah. She was a social worker, so she brought her social worker skills to the movement. And what that was is that she helped pre-screen African Americans to let them know how to defend themselves nonviolently. And that was Dr. King's mantra. So in the book, you see, it's the point of view of a non-African American, a white lady, a volunteer, who left her house, who decided that she wanted to help African Americans achieve equality. And she put her life on the line like so many others. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, Denise, when you look at the old footage of uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King, you see, 
all the different ethnicities, African American, Latino American rabbis. Yes. And I always wondered, Denise, who are these people walking on, on alongside of Dr. King? And mm-hmm. I happened to find one. Her name was Beth Luther. Wow. So I, I read this memoir uh, two years ago, written by her sister, Meredith Copel, about Beth's life. Uh, Beth passed away in her early 40s due to lung cancer, but she married an African-American man and had two beautiful kids. And so the memoir was for her kids to understand who their mom was. Mm -hmm. And and when I read it, I said, wow, this would make a fantastic book and a great movie. And so I went, I I set up a meeting at Simon & Schuster in New York, and and then I sold the book. And now it's out on the market, and it's it's doing pretty well. It sure is. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I hope people get a chance to, to pick up the book, Bev. It's in Barnes & Noble's bookstores and online on Amazon. And uh, and so my next goal is to, is to make a, a feature film out of it. And we cannot wait. Again, listeners, we are speaking with Maddie Rich. He's the author of the novel, Bev, uh, by Andrea Williams and Maddie Rich, that is. Now, Maddie, you have developed and produced and directed several television and film projects having worked with so many great artists, including the late Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown, (laughs) Glenn Turman, and so many more. Now, you've been speaking about black history uh, broadly, just momentarily, but what exactly does Black History Month mean to you? Well, Black Black History Month means to acknowledge that that we, as an African-American community, have contributed to so much in this country, to everything in this country, if you think about it, from the the arts to the business to science, you know, uh, it's just to let people know that our heritage, for our young people to know that, you know, we, we are a great community. We have served America so great, and we continue to serve America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, it, to me, Black History Month should not just be February. It should be every single month of this year that we acknowledge, you know, uh, that we are, you know, upstanding great citizens and great Americans. Uh, and then I had, like you said, I had an opportunity to work with, you know, the great Whitney Houston yes. and Bobby Brown, Bobby Brown on a television project called a Subway Scholar. And Whitney was a fantastic person to work wow. with. She made me laugh and so did Bobby. Uh, and they were great, great people. And, and, and I'm talking about not, outside, you know, you know, when the cameras were off, you know, mm-hmm. uh, just great, great people in, 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 in and she will be very, very, she's very, very missed by oh, me. Oh, yes, she is. Yes, and, and, um, and then Glenn Terman is, he's my buddy. I mean, we had the equal. I, you know, I directed that. I love when I, that movie. I oh, love thank it. you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The equal continues to play on television. So does mm-hmm. Straight Out of Brooklyn. But equal is like a, a fan favorite. And oh, I'm yes. so appreciative of a new generation watching that movie. And I had some great actors like, you know, Glenn Terman and, mm-hmm. Suzanne Douglas, Vanessa Bell Calloway, Jada Pinkett Smith, of course, Lorenz Tate, yes. Dwayne Martin, mm. uh, Morris Chestnut. I mean, the list goes on and, and on. on. Yes, it does, and it's so impressive, and your works have been really impressive. And again, I cannot wait to hear from you again to see what else is going on on the horizon for you. How can my listeners learn more about you, Maddie? You can reach me at Twitter and Facebook at Maddie Rich underscore E-N-T. Maddie Rich underscore E N T on Instagram, uh, and on Twitter, and on Facebook. All right, and there we are. And anything that you have more to share, you know, there's an open invite for you to come back to In the Know Radio Magazine show. We do. I always enjoy speaking with you, Denise. Thank you so much, Maddie. Maddie Rich, author of the novel Bev. Make sure you pick it up and contact and follow him. Maddie, thank you so much. Have a wonderful okay. weekend. Okay, you too. All right, and again, listeners, that was Maddie Rich, author of the book. Bev, really, really great book that I want you to go out and um, check out and follow him as well on Twitter and Facebook as I do. Again, and he's the Andrea Williams. She's an author, editor, and journalist living right here in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband and four children. And again, based on the real-life story of a little known figure in the civil rights movement, Bev. And again, February is Black History Month. And here's a little-known black history fact. Interracial marriage in the United States was banned in 1664 and not overturned until 1967. 
During the 17th and early 18th century, the growing number of interracial marriages, also known as uh, miscegenation between blacks and whites, led to the passage of this new law. The first anti-miscegenation law enacted was in the colony of Maryland in 1664, and additional colonies quickly followed suit. These marriages were prohibited, and penalties included the enslavement, exile, or imprisonment of the white perpetrator. These laws grew and evolved over the years, and attempts were given, were even made to modify the Constitution to ban interracial marriage in all states. In 2000, Alabama became the last state to officially legalize interracial marriage by removing the unenforceable ban that was still contained in their state constitution. So again, interracial marriage in the United States was banned in 1664 and not overturned until 1967. A little known black history fact right here, February during Black History Month. You're listening to another edition of In the Know, the Jazzy Radio Magazine Show. And we will be right back with you. back again everyone and thanks for tuning in to another edition of in the know the jazzy radio magazine show and right this time we are turning the pages in the magazine to our entertainment segment and on the lines with me is the great jazz artist and drummer daniel glass daniel welcome to the show how are you hey thanks for having me on denise really appreciate it 
I am looking forward to this conversation, and we are actually going to open it, reflecting back to the beginning, Daniel. Growing up in Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii, at the age of eight, you began playing the drums. Share more information about the early life of Daniel Glass. Uh, well, I, uh, my mother was a professional dancer uh, she, when I was a little kid. She was a uh, modern dancer, and she, um, unfortunately, when I was about six years old, she broke her leg in a, mm. during one of her dances mm -hmm. and uh, as a way during her rehabilitation to continue to be artistic, she started taking drum lessons, and I used to go with her. And when I was seven, uh, the teacher said, well, I can start taking him. So around seven years old, uh, I started taking lessons. Um, I became obsessed. I had already been like, you know, a pot and pan type kid. And uh, I just continued to, uh, to, to play. Uh, and I think growing up in Hawaii is a very unusual place, obviously. Um, it, it was multicultural before the term multicultural existed. There's people from all different cultures, uh, all kind of living there together in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so my ears were open not only to a lot of different kinds of, you know, sort of American music, um, but also Japanese and Chinese and Filipino and Portuguese and, of course, all the local Hawaiian and other Polynesian uh, sounds, yes. musical sounds, percussion sounds. So it was a really, uh, it was a really cool place to grow up. I'll bet, and it's just a dream place for so many people to visit. So uh, I know it was lovely. Yes, and it's yeah. So I, I, I recommend everybody, even if you think you've been to tropical and beautiful places, uh -huh. go to Hawaii. It really is a one of a kind place. It's oh, amazing. most definitely. Now, uh, Daniel, in 1994, you joined a powerhouse from Los Angeles called Royal Crown Review. Talk to us about your significant career in the world of TV and film as it relates to RCR. Sure. Well, uh, I decided, to, I actually got a regular college degree. It wasn't until I got done with college that I said, you know what, I've been doing this music thing my whole life, and that's really where my passion lies. And so uh, in 1991, I moved to Los Angeles, and I went to a music school out there. Uh, and a couple years after getting out of school, I was getting more and more interested in jazz and uh, all different kinds of, of um what I like to call classic American music. So everything from 1920s jazz to big band, 1930s swing to bebop to rhythm and blues. I noticed you played a fantastic rhythm and blues tune yes. right before this interview. Yes. Um, who was that, by the way? I don't know the artist, but I know the song. Well, the song that you just heard, let me look here. It was um, number seven, Turn Me Around the Roots and TV on the Radio. Very cool. Yes. Well, definitely that. You know, that kind of stuff, that's what Royal Crown Review was, was all about. And the great thing about Royal Crown Review, um, probably one of the best connections that people might have with that band is that if, if you saw the film The Mask with Jim Carrey, where he becomes that mask superhero character wearing the suit suit, um, his movie was from 1993, uh, there's a big swing dance scene. It was Cameron Diaz's first film. And she and Jim Carrey do this big swing dance scene, and a lot of people have seen that movie, remember that movie, it was a very popular movie. Yes. The band in that film performing that song during that scene is Royal Crown Review, and that wow. song uh, that we performed sort of became our signature song, um, and it's called Hey Pachuco. Okay. And um, basically, when I joined this band, it was a, a, an L.A. phenomenon, but as time went on, um, we got signed to Warner Brothers Records, um, and had a, a pretty amazing career. And what was so interesting about that band was that, you know, we were playing all these different varieties of, like I said, early American music, roots music, swing music, rhythm and blues, jazz, uh, rockabilly, western swing, early rock and roll, all, all forms. Uh, we were really into it. And, um, but we were young. We were all in our 20s, okay. and we mm -hmm. had grown up playing rock and roll. And so we sort of combined the youthful sensibility with the older music, and that created a whole resurgence called Retro Swing. And it became okay. huge in the 1990s. Probably people remember back. Um, so we toured all over the world. We got to work with incredible artists, James Brown, Bette Midler. Um, we had our own terrific career, traveled all over the world. And uh, we, we did quite a few 
Um, that song, Hey Pachuco, it won a season of Dancing with the Stars. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, like I said, we work with people like James Brown and Bette Midler. And, oh, yes. Um, you know, we had a pretty incredible run uh, in the 90s and into the 2000s. We had a long career down in Australia and in Europe. And uh, so it was, a, it was a pretty magical band. We played the Hollywood Bowl, Radio City Music Hall, a lot of, a lot of great places. And, yeah, so um, good. check it out. Go to royalcrownreview.com. You can learn more about that band. Now, you teach the history and the tradition of the drums, but, Daniel, in what ways do your drum clinics focus on the relationship between drumming and popular American music styles like early jazz? Yeah, well, so through, you know, I, as I mentioned, I had uh, I had gotten a, a proper college degree, a bachelor's degree, and mm-hmm. so I had developed, you know, over the years, some pretty good researching and writing skills. And when I became a full-time musician, you know, my focus was on just, getting better at my instrument, obviously, and working with the band, and it was just music, 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 music all the time. Mm -hmm. And after, um, you know, maybe 10 years of that, in the late 1990s, I was sort of missing the academic aspect of of my life, you know, and wanted to tap back in with that. And so what I started to do was interview a lot of the drummers uh, that had played on the records that were inspiring us, the guys that had played with Louis Jordan and... Uh, Louis Prima and Benny Goodman and Duke Ellington, um, you know, and I, uh, guys that played on Little Richard Records and yes. Elvis Presley Records. Mm-hmm. I interviewed um, in the course of maybe, uh, you know, a bunch of different years, uh, 50 or 60 of these of these legendary drummers. And many of them were sort of drummers that hadn't really ever received any attention from any magazines or any writers in that regard. And once I interviewed them, I became friends with them. And I really realized that there was an incredible story to tell that nobody was telling. So I started writing articles, and then I started writing books uh, and making DVDs, not not only about the history of the drum set, but about the evolution of American popular music. And what was cool about that is that I was not just a historian who was talking about it. I was a musician who actually had been playing all of this music and who was Mm -hmm. deeply steeped in it. Uh-huh. Um, and so I could really come at it from a, 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 you know, a personal perspective. I wasn't just sort of uh, commenting on it as, a, as maybe a typical historian would do. So I started doing uh, clinics, um, and, and over the first years they were for drummers. Uh-huh. I have a DVD called The Century Project that looks at uh, the history and evolution of the drum set. And um, it's a, the drum set is an amazing instrument. It's... Um, it's the only instrument that we use in, in popular music today uh, and have used for the last hundred plus years since the beginning of jazz, really, that is completely formed in America um, and really brings together um, all these aspects of American life. Um, immigration talks about, you know, black and white issues. Um, and it's just this, it's an amazing reflection of the story of America, which is all these cultures being thrown together, coming together, taking older ideas, turning them, you know, using innovation to create something new and to further the culture of the world. And all of and, that, um, and, yeah. And I was just going to say all of the very much needed because we are uh, in the jazz community. This is a jazz show, and it's very great information yeah. that you're sharing. So in closing our conversation, how can my listeners learn more about your projects, any new DVDs, movies, books you're working on? Absolutely. Uh, well, they can certainly go to my website, which is uh, DanielGlass.com, just spelled as it sounds, DanielGlass.com, mm-hmm. one word. And uh, they can go to the merchandise section. All of the different products I have are there. There are trailers, the DVDs, etc. cetera. Um, I, I'm speaking and doing presentations all the time uh, all, over the, all over the country. So um, I'll be speaking at a music conference in April. Mm-hmm. I'll be actually doing some clinics in the Midwest, uh, in Minneapolis, Milwaukee, and Chicago um, in the month of May. Uh, I'll be out in San Diego a little later this year. Uh, I'll be in L.A. doing a whole bunch of gigs also in May. Uh, And if anybody comes to New York City, I live in New York City, I play every Monday night at Birdland, uh, the famous jazz club Birdland, every Monday night uh, doing a really cool show called Cast Party. Okay. Which is, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, like a Broadway cabaret show. Oh, and one other thing, Denise, I'm sure. sorry, I'm loading it on. But in May, 
I am hosting the second annual Daniel Glass New York Jazz Intensive. Oh, wow. Uh, we get people to come to New York for four days, uh, mm-hmm. drummers, and we, for four days and nights, uh, get deep, deep into uh, jazz, the history of jazz, oh, the yes. technique of jazz, mm-hmm. and we take them all over the city uh, to all different kinds of clubs. We have concerts, great musicians. Everybody sits in with professional New York rhythm section. Oh, I have that's going to be very wonderful. heavyweight guests. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm doing it, and there's I, I ha- I'm sad to say I have not yet updated my gig calendar page on my website for 2017. But in talking to you, I realize I need to do that. So. They can go, uh, if they have any questions, they can email me from there, and uh, I'm happy to share whatever knowledge I can. Sounds good, and we've got to get you here to Nashville soon uh, because yes, we, ma'am. yes, because I'm very, very interested in that, and I've got to promote your DVD right here on In the No Radio Magazine show. Very good. Well, if you, um, if we, if you uh, shoot me an email or we could stay in touch after the interview, I'll get you a lot of information in case your listeners are interested. I come to Nashville all the time. I love. Oh, that. great, great. Love it. Love well, we'll definitely have to hook up, Daniel. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful, and let's have you back again uh-huh. very soon. Very good. Thank you for having me, Denise. You're welcome, Daniel. Have a great weekend. Okay, you too. Thanks. And again, listeners, that was Daniel Glass, fabulous artist, drummer, and um, he, he's also a jazz artist, everyone. So make sure you reach out to Daniel Glass. Really big thanks to him for being my guest today, right here during the entertainment segment of In the Know, the Jazzy Radio Magazine Show. And we'll be right back.
When murder came knocking on his door at three years old, Rod Demery answered and never looked back. In ID's upcoming series, Murder Chose Me, retired and Reverend Shreveport homicide detective Rod Demery reflects on his 14 years as a homicide detective. At this time, we are turning the pages in the magazine to our lifestyle segment. And on the lines with me is Rod Demery. Rod, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here with us, and I'd like to begin our conversation on a more personal level. At the age of three, your mother was murdered, and later when you were in your 20s, your brother uh, was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Uh, now, since then, Rod, you have vowed that no family would be denied justice. How did your mother's murder lead you to the life of an investigator? You know, I'm not sure it did, but I know it made me a better investigator. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think I was predestined to do it. I think, you know, that was my calling, my mission. But uh, I, I think the, the circumstance just made me a better detective. Okay, um, and want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about this. Being a detective from Shreveport, that is, tell us how it has affected you. And you're such a, you're such a really great detective. Tell us more about that. Well, we um, had... I think during my tenure, I think there was probably 254 murders. Mm -hmm. um, and the murders that I was lead on, I was able to solve them. Um, I, you know, and I don't know if that was uh, uh, anything other than just my obsession with the job. I, I did it all the time. That's all I thought about. That's all I did. Um, you know, it's, it's a very personal crime. And being that I had been from that and knew what it felt like on both sides of it, I, I, I believe that's uh, where the success came from. Okay, now you're also the author of the 2011 Amazon Kindle bestseller, uh, Things My Daughters Need to Know, A Cop and Father's View of Sex, Relationships, and Happiness. Tell us more about this book and how it has encouraged your daughters. Yeah, that, that book is a, a very frank discussion. Um, and, and, you know, just as a title, things, things My Daughters Need to Know, it was just my um, sort of an open letter to my daughter at the time. She was... Uh, turn into a teenager, mm -hmm. and I wanted her to avoid some of the pitfalls that were common, you know, how to detect when somebody was deceiving her, um, look beyond the surface and kind of understand whether or not someone was sincere or someone was just, uh, you know, they had other motives. Uh, there's a lot of frank discussion about uh, relationships, how they fail, and, and some of the things that, that she and others needed to look out for. Mm -hmm. I noticed that a, a few people liked it, so I published it, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I have Fair a... Plan. I have a daughter, Rod, and, and this information is very vital for anyone who has a daughter. But how did you use your interviewing and interrogation skills to spot a liar? You know, I think everybody has that talent. I, I don't think they realize it because they've never had to use it as a profession. But, you know, when you have children, I mean, you start developing it, I mean, even as a kid, but uh, especially when you have children. You know, yes. just voice inflections. For instance, if you you got a broken lamp in the house and you, you ask your son or daughter, did you break the lamp? And they answer, I didn't break it. Well, that just leads to the next question. Well, yes. you, you obviously know who did. So mm -hmm. some of those things you just have to hone in on. It. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of natural, but I think once you're aware of it, you, you get better at it. Yeah, and just and, and just reading your book, I've got to actually pick it up so that I, it can be a guide to me because we all want our daughters to be able to spot that, you know, deceitful person out there because they are there. So, again, uh, the name of the book, um, everyone, is things my daughters need to know, um, a cop and father's view of sex relationships and happiness. Uh, speaking with Rod Demery, now you continue, Rod, to be driven by one mission in life, and that is to find justice and resolution for the families of murder victims just like your own. Tell us about this new season of Investigation Discovery's Murder Chose Me. Well, the television series is about uh, the cases that I worked in Shreveport. It basically, um, I, I kind of host a show and narrate, and there's reenactments of each crime. Um, the, the interesting thing about it, is it, it shows a very personal side. Mm -hmm. So my personal story is kind of intertwined with it. You know, my hope is, or my prayers is that, you know, people can kind of get an idea that murder is just not this thing that happens. You know, we become so desensitized to it that we, you know, actually realize that people actually feel the pain mm -hmm. in communities at least my prayers, communities come together, support each other, and understand that these are real people, real pain, and real victims. 
Now, you're also the author of another book, which is A No Place for Race. Now, being this year's February and Black History Month, tell us more about that, No Place for Race. Well, that book uh, I, I wrote in 2013, and it talks a lot about um, historical issues um, with police in the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and I kind of take the focus off the individual person and, and, and focus more on the economic uh, disadvantages, educational disparities. Um, where we were in the mid '60s and where we are now, mm-hmm. uh, I talk a lot to law enforcement about how they don't have the luxury of having any opinions when it comes to, you know, any social political views that their job is to protect and, and serve. Not to sound clichéish, but that's just not a luxury we have. Now, again, listeners, we have been speaking with Rod Demery, and um, the host of Murder Sh- Murder Chose Me on the Investigation Discovery. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Murder Chose Me in closing our conversation, Rod. Well, it's on Wednesday nights. Uh, this is the first season at uh, 9 Central, 10 Eastern. Um, I really think that it's um, put together well. You know, um, the, like, I, like I said, it's a very personal story, as well as, you know, people get their fix for, for true crime in that genre. But I, I think the, the, the personal side of it kind of humanizes the homicide, murder, investigation, uh, victims, and even suspects. So I, I think it's uh, well worth the look. I'm sure it is, and I can't wait to watch it myself. Rod Demery, thank you so much. And, hey, there's an open invite when you'd like to come back to In the Know Radio Magazine show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I love this. Thank you so much, and you have a really blessed weekend, Rod. You too. Thank you. And again, listeners, Bye-bye. that was Rod Demery. Uh, make sure that you uh, watch this show because, as I mentioned, uh, it's Murder Chose Me, and he is the host. Again, murder has been a part of Rod Demery's life for a long time, as long as he can remember. Uh, because, as stated, when he was just three years old, his mother was murdered. Then, when Demery was in his 20s, his brother was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. But instead of succumbing to the cycle, he resolved to do everything in his power not to repeat the mistakes of the past and pursued a career in criminal justice. In his 14 years with the Victim Violent Crimes Unit, Demery solved or assisted in more than 250 homicide cases, solving each of the 60-plus cases on which he was the lead detective. So again, Rod Demery, check out his, uh, his show, Murder Chose Me, and um, it has actually premiered on this past Wednesday on the Investigation Discovery Channel. Now, you're listening to another edition of In the Know Radio Magazine Show. And um, I want to give you some information before we go back on break because February is also American Heart Month. The American Heart Association wants to help everyone live longer, healthier lives so they can enjoy all of life's precious moments. Um, And we know that starts with taking care of your health. American Heart Month, a federally designated event, is a great way to remind Americans to focus on their hearts and to encourage them to get their families, friends, and communities involved. Now, so did you know that the first American Heart Month, which took place in February of 1964, was proclaimed by the President Lyndon B. Johnson via Proclamation 3566 on December 30th, 1963. Now, the Congress, by joint resolution on that date, has requested the president to issue annually a proclamation designating February as American Heart Month. At that time, more than half the deaths in the U.S. were caused by cardiovascular disease. While American Heart Month is a federally designated month in the United States, it's important to realize that cardiovascular disease knows no borders Cardiovascular disease, including heart disease and stroke, remains the leading global cause of death with more than 17.3 million deaths each year. And that number is expected to rise to more than 23.6 million by 2030. So again, February uh, is National American Heart Month. You're listening to another edition of In the Know, the Jazzy Radio Magazine Show. And we will be right back with you. Wow. 
Let's go. I'm Jonathan. I'm a big supporter of Radio Free Nashville. Tune in daily at 2 p.m. for Democracy Now!, the national daily independent award-winning news program hosted by journalist Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez. Democracy Now! provides access to people and perspectives rarely heard in the U.S. corporate-sponsored media, including independent and international journalists. Ordinary people from around the world who are directly affected by U.S. foreign policy, grassroots leaders and peace activists, artists, academics, and independent analysts. Hear the real debate weekdays at 2 on Democracy Now! Right here on Radio Free Nashville. Like a wide range of music? Then tune in to the Haggard and Haggard Radio Hour, a fixture on Radio Free Nashville since 2008. Host Steve Haggard plays an eclectic mix of music of many styles and many eras. Americana, blues, rock, folk, rockabilly, old standards, indie music, songs in other languages, plus a lot of meaningless less banter. The Haggard and Haggard Radio Hour, Tuesdays at 4 on Radio Free Nashville. Hey, all y'all blues children out there. Y'all tune in to Have Blues Will Travel, Thursday nights, 8 to 9, on Radio Free Nashville. 
Gonna give you that good down home blues, y'all. Hola, Tunje. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Rainy nights, you from Africa. Oh, yeah, yeah. From Africa. Oh, yeah. Saturday afternoon into high gear with a mix of Afropop tunes from across the globe. Let's embark on an exhilarating journey from Haitian compa to South African house, from Kenya near Seoul to GRC Lingala, infused with rich Caribbean mixes and soul, hip hop, R&B from up and coming artists of Afro descent in Europe, USA, and expansive diaspora. These and countless more experiences await you. Come join us every Saturday, 1 till 3 p.m. It's Hot Air on Radio Free Nashville. Sit back, relax, and be rejuvenated on In the Know, the jazzy radio magazine show that keeps you in the know about entertainment, health, food, fashion, lifestyles, and community affairs. Join host Denise Barnes Fridays 9 to 10 a.m. on 1037-107.1 FM WRFN. Hello, have you heard about the Indie Film Minute? No one thing makes the wide world of independent film great, or even makes the great ones great. At the Indie Film Minute, we accept the challenge to identify and bring to your attention worthy films from the archives of the independent realm. We love these films, and we look forward to sharing them with you. Hear the Indie Film Minutes weekday mornings during RFN Early Brew on Radio Free Nashville. Hey, Radio Free Nashville listeners. Do you or a loved one deal with mental illness? Are you looking for hope, resources, and encouraging stories? Then you'll love the NAMI Radio Hour brought to you by NAMI Tennessee, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Central, right here on WRFM Pasquale, Radio Free Nashville. Reminisce Radio is for the mature, sophisticated, and discerning mind. For those of you who want to visit the Big Band era, guess at history and trivia about Glenn Miller, Roy Rogers, and Dale Evans, and I bet you know which one of them wrote Happy Trails. And sing along to the songs you grew up with. Please tune in with Drew Laney at 4 p.m. Mondays. Sit back, relax, and be rejuvenated on In the Know, the jazzy radio magazine show that keeps you in the know about entertainment, health, food, fashion, lifestyles, and community affairs. Join host Denise Barnes Fridays 9 to 10 a.m. on 1037-107.1 FM WRFN. And we are back just for a moment here. I wanted to give you another black history uh, fact. Since February is deemed as Black History Month, Black History Month began as Negro History Week, which was created in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson, a noted African-American historian, scholar, educator, and publisher. It became a month-long celebration in 1976. The month of February was chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass, and Abraham Lincoln. I was standing by my window on a cold and cloudy day when I saw First to come in just to take my mother away. So I'm told the undertaker, undertaker, please drive slow for this body. You are hauling Yes, I hate to see Where I go Will the circles Be unbroken By and by, Lord By and by There is a better 
home awaiting in the skies, Lord, in the sky. Well, I'll follow close behind her. Thought I would hold her and be brave. And I could not hide my sorrow when they laid her in the grave in the circle. were emptied by one by one they went away now my family they are parted when we see each other someday in a circle Unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by, there is a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky, in the sky, Lord. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. And we are back again. Thanks, everyone. We are entering our second hour of In the Know, the Jazzy Radio Magazine show, right here on Radio Free Nashville, 1071 and 103.7 FM. I hope you are enjoying the show. And again, remember, you can connect with me, Denise Barnes, on social media, on Facebook. That page is In the Know Radio Magazine Show. And my handle on Twitter is ITK Radio Mag Show. So now I want you to continue to sit back, relax, and be rejuvenated right here. And I want to say thanks to my earlier guest today, Maddie Rich, author of the book Bev, the novel that is, and drummer and jazz artist Daniel Glass was my guest. Also, Rod Demery from Investigation Discoveries uh, series, Murder Chose Me, all during the first hour of In the Know Radio Magazine show. And we have other fabulous guests coming up. Media. Media is a uh, show that's coming on TV One, and I have got a guest coming up very soon, and you are going to love her. She is actually uh, portrayed as uh, the uh, lethal recipe for a powerful matriarch, Jackie Jones, and it is actually Penny Johnson Gerald. She's going to be my guest, and we're going to talk about this new show on TV One. Uh, you will love it, and I'm looking forward to my conversation with um, her coming up very soon. Again, that's Penny Johnson, Gerald. And again, February is Black History Month, and we have actually been playing the soundtrack for a revolution. And the latest song was Will the Circle Be Unbroken by Richie Haven. So I hope you have enjoyed uh, the selections on today. Again, um, honoring Black History Month the month of February, right here on Radio Free Nashville. And again, as I mentioned, um, I have on the lines with me, we're going to talk uh, to this beautiful lady, uh, Miss Penny Johnson Gerald is my guest on today, and we are going to talk about the uh, show Media and uh, Passion, Intrigue, and Murder become a lethal recipe for a powerful matriarch, Jackie Jones, and her children in this captivating urban production. Again, Penny Johnson Gerald, welcome to the show. How are you? 
Okay, and we're going to have her on very soon. And in the meantime, uh, just information um, about her. She is the uh, founder of Jones Universal Media okay, Properties. Yes, uh-huh. again, we have Penny Johnson Gerald on the line during my entertainment segment. How are you, Penny? I am great this morning, and yourself? Hey, I'm looking forward to media. I can't wait. Well, we are just about here. Yes, we are. Penny, talk about your experience working with TV One on this project. Well, this was a very different um, approach in in working in that this is my first time dealing with the um, African American Network, Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to expect to see if it was a different experience or not. Uh, Some people would like to think, oh, a step down, perhaps, from some of the major networks. Mm -hmm. However, my experience was different, and it was different in that everyone has their A-game on. It's as though we are the best of the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And so it proved me wrong on all ends or whatever I had, preconceived notions. It, It made me think that all I really wanted to do was to be a part of keeping it that way. And I am so proud to be part of a project that lends itself to that. Oh, yes. Um, Discuss working, Penny, with your fellow cast members and creative team, including Radio One founder and chairperson Kathy Hughes and Tracy Twinkie Bird. Well, first of all, Miss Hughes, Kathy was on the set every day. Mm -hmm. So the energy was live. The energy was knowing that here we are, uh, being able to bring to life this baby that she's had all this time. I mean, media has been in the working for about eight years. Mm-hmm. So it, it was just so very positive. Her and She could have been anywhere else, but she was there every day, day in and day out, lending herself with this positive energy, mm-hmm. knowing that, oh, is it a girl? Is it a boy? Oh, no, it's something <laughs> better than that. Yeah. It's like dynasty and... Um, the Godfather combined together wow. made something wonderful, and the cast was extraordinary and different in that when you when I particularly walked onto the set, I didn't know a lot of the cast members personally. Mm-hmm. I knew of their work, but ne- I had never met them. But and there was an immediate comfort in that uh, there was re- respect and love and <clears throat> just. Um, Everyone wanted to be supportive in making your thing better than what you've ever done before. Okay. So we would challenge each other and support each other in bringing out the best performances. And, and how did you prepare for the role, and why, why did you choose to play this character? First of all, <laughs> well, I'm going to answer the second question first. Okay. When I, when I read the script, I was on... I'm sure, was maybe page two. And I said, oh, my gosh, this is good. Mm -hmm. And then up to page 10, I said, okay, I'm doing this. (laughs) And that was mostly because I saw us on the first 10 pages, and I'd never seen them. Us telling own stories with truth. And I really wanted to be a part of it. And um, so that's why I wanted to do this. And Preparing for this, I then I didn't know that it was loosely based on Miss Hughes. And when I say loosely based, I mean the integrity, her personality, her passion, mm-hmm. her vision to do something like this. And so I actually listened to a lot of interviews. And what I gathered from those interviews was in line with my reason for wanting to do it. And it, it actually helped me in preparation for it is that we wanted to break the stereotype yes, and, and show us as we truly are as well-rounded, well-rounded people. And so that's why I'm a part of the project. I'm proud of the project. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I will wait for everyone to see the project Saturday at 8 o'clock, you know, Eastern Standard Time. It's, it's 
going to be so wonderful. I know it is. And again, we are excited about it. Just for my listeners' information, media focuses on the Jones family, who owns and operates Jump, a dynasty that has dominated the national urban media scene for years. And on the lines with me is Penny Johnson Gerald, and she portrays the powerful matriarch Jackie Jones on the show. Uh, talk to us about your character's relationship with the other members of the Jones family. Well, I am the mother. Mm-hmm. I have four beautiful children played by Prince Hall, Brian White, Christy Ferris, and Blue Kimball. They mm-hmm. are my children, and they're my children in real life, uh, apparently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, as their mother bringing them up in, into this empire that was built from the ground up, the quest is to make sure the family business stays strong mm-hmm. and not... Uh, just relaxing because you're at the top because that's when you have to fight your hardest and yes rightly so because we do have a nemesis family mm-hmm. the Randolph family yes uh, the Bishop and Gary Dordan okay and I'm, I'm telling you oh uh, my that's goodness that's where the conflict rises oh and my so goodness. you see power but you see the struggle and you see conflict which for great television. Oh my goodness, yes it is. And you know, uh, a few years back I interviewed Brian White. I had the pleasure of interviewing him and he says uh, regarding media and Kathy Hughes, I am honored to portray this character and that Ka- Kathy Hughes trusted me to headline a project that she is so passionate about. And I'm, a, I'm, well, I'm just I, excited about this. Well, I have to echo that. And I, m- more than that, We've, we've gotten the green light to go to series, so the viewers can get a taste of who we are on mm-hmm. Saturday at 8 on TV1, but they also will get to follow us on this journey and feel themselves. It's kind of like Dynasty, as I said before, Dynasty meaning the Godfather. Wow. And it is full of some delicious, oh, delicious Oh, my goodness. Drink. Can't wait to taste that, Jackie. I can't wait to taste that, uh, Penny, that is. Again, Penny Johnson, Gerald, please feel free to share any details on any of your upcoming projects, including any additional work with TV One. Well, you know, that that question has been asked, and it is a question where any actor will jump on. But right now, I just want to just lift up media because all the other projects that I have going on, are actually wonderful, and you will see them as they unfold. But right now, media is most and foremost important, and that's mainly because of the the, the climate of the election, how mm-hmm. uh, the um, the reality and the the truth of what's going on in America has finally been unveiled, and we are educated now in that area. Our voices are being heard now politically, and I. To be the voice for us in the climate of communications and sharing. You've been given a bad rap right now mm-hmm. uh, as being media, but the show media will be a platform for us to be able to share communication, see the importance of it, and to get involved. And so that's a voice in itself. So um, it, it's self serving to me to really promote media on all ends and allow the other projects to fall. Yeah, they would. Penny Johnson Gerald, my guest during the entertainment segment, talking about media. Penny, we can't wait for this show. We're excited. One more time. When does it air and on what station? Oh my goodness. It airs Saturday, yes. which is tomorrow. Oh yes it is. Twenty fifth uh-huh. on T V one at eight PM Eastern Standard Time. Looking forward to it again, Jackie. There is an open invite when you would like to come back to In the Know Radio Magazine show. And again, she's portraying Jackie uh, on the show media, Penny Johnson Gerald. Thank you so much. You have a blessed weekend. Thank you. You have a blessed weekend, too, and I can't wait to come back. All right. You have a wonderful one. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and again, I will talk. And again, listeners, that was uh, we were talking about the show Media. It's very, very, uh, really good show that we're going to be uh, having on TV One. Thanks again, going out to Penny Johnson Gerald. She's portraying Jackie Jones. Hey, passion, intrigue, and murder become a lethal recipe for a powerful matriarch 
Jackie Jones and her children in this captivating urban production. So don't miss it tomorrow, everyone. That's going to be tomorrow, February the 25th on TV One. Check your local listings for media. Again, thanks to uh, that guest on today. And I hope you are enjoying the show, another edition of In the Know, the jazzy radio magazine show. I am your host, Denise Barnes, right here with you. And when we return, more of the show will be right back with you.
And we are back again, everyone. Thanks for joining me for another edition of In the Know, the jazzy radio magazine show that keeps you in the know about entertainment, health, food, fashion, lifestyles, and community affairs. And at this time, we are turning the pages of the magazine to the food segment. And I have had the pleasure of interviewing Jordan Smith. He is the owner and CEO of the Lost Seafood Restaurant located right here in Nashville, Tennessee. And he speaks with me about the restaurant, how he got his start, and all of that good stuff and and those delicious lobsters, crabs, good seafood that Jordan Smith has to offer at the Lost Seafood Restaurant. Denise Barnes with Jordan Smith, the owner of the Lost Seafood Restaurant here in Nashville, Tennessee. How are you today, Jordan? I'm fine, Miss Denise. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and thanks again for interviewing with me. Let's begin our conversation reflecting on the beginning of your dream. How did the Lost Seafood come into fruition? I all started when I was, well, the dream came about. I was staying in a lifestyle apartment out on North Nashville on 23rd, mm-hmm. and me and my fiance was standing there. And I always done sold food, like on the side, on the side, uh, in the back. Well, they had a beauty shop. It was a barber shop. I used to sell to the beauty shop and the barber shop. Mm-hmm. So one day I was like, I came to my brother. And I'm just like, I want to sell, let's sell plates. You mm-hmm. know, let's sell plates, let's sell food to the, you know, to the city. So he okay, he like, okay, let's do it. So we started, we bought a tent. Mm-hmm. That was not the best idea in the world. Oh, you know, wow. We bought the, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> the tent, the tent was terrible. Like, I used to be out there with the tent. It'll be raining. Mm. It, the wind blew it down one time. Oh, it broke. no. Like, we had to set it up, make it stand up a different type of way. So that was real difficult on me. So mm-hmm. he was like, we got back together and we came up with the idea, you know, let's start setting it out my house. Okay. So we started setting it out the house, at the apartment. That's where the name came from, the loft. The loft. Yes, okay. Malcolm was in the loft style apartment. Mm-hmm. So after, after about four or five days, my landlord came to me and was like, y'all cannot sell food out of here anymore. Oh wow. I'm like, for real? Mm, <laughs> I'm like, what nah. a shocker. <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, we can't. He like, no. Nah. Y'all cannot sell food out here anymore. This is not a sit-down style type restaurant Mm -hmm. or anything like that. So Mm -hmm. that same day as us getting put out of the apartment from selling food, my uncle had already had a restaurant prior to us doing this. Okay. you know, he heard about it and he came to us and was like, why y'all never came to me and said anything? So, you know, after he said that, we took him up on his offer. Mm-hmm. And from there, it was history. We ain't looked back since. You. The rest is history, as they <laughs> say. Now, Jordan, the highlight of the Love Seafood is that the restaurant offers a casual atmosphere, perfect for dining. What are some other amenities that actually enhance the, the establishment? Oh, uh, well, I want to say when you come in, we have a great wall that you can sign. Mm-hmm. When you, as soon as you come in, you can ask for the markers and anything. Half of Nashville has been in the restaurant, so it's plenty. It's filled up with plenty of names. Yes. My customer service is great. That's what I pride myself off and my staff off of, having great customer service. If you got great customer service and great food, you can't lose. Absolutely. So that's, that's one of the best amenities that we have is the great customer service. Sounds good. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to tell the, my listeners about the Loft Seafood Restaurant? Uh, right now we're like I said we're an up and coming business. It's it's ran and owned by some young young black men trying to stay out of trouble. That's all that we're about trying to stay out of trouble and trying to give back. Mm-hmm. It's on the corner of Brick Church and Fern. So if you're ever in the area, it's right off the interstate. If you're coming from Murfreesboro, Hendersonville, Antioch, or anything like that, it's very easy to get to. Mm-hmm. We, we welcome anybody and everybody. We're just trying to expand and grow and just bring some good different type of food to the to the city. Okay, and also joining me, listeners, is Miss Charlzetta Hall, and she's going to ask a few questions of you for the community. I know yes. you interact a lot in the community, yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, here's Charlzetta Hall. Hello, Jordan Smith. How you doing, Miss Hall? How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm blessed. What I want to talk to you about is a little bit about the community and what you are doing, as well as your testimony. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've had... I've had a clothing drive before at my church. It's Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church on County Hospital Road. 
I've also done things like collect the water for Flint. And if you still want to come bring, drop off water to the restaurant, bottle of water, we just ask that you drop it off and place it on the inside and we'll send it off to Flint or anything. Oh, okay. yes, ma'am. Hey, give us that address again. It's 1211 Brick Church Pike. Thank you. Now, a little bit about your testimony. What inspired you? All right. I was, <laughs> I was me being a, a troubled, troubled kid coming up. Like I come from, I come from a family of hard workers. Don't get me wrong, but I was always into a lot of trouble. I was into different little stuff. I mean, I, I dropped out of school. I had my first little girl when I was 15. So this right here is like it's saving my life. Like I, I, I don't know where I would be at if it wasn't for the loft right now. I've, I done been through so much. I family members not being able to come around. You know, he's a trouble kid. He's a trouble kid, and I turned all that around, and I've grown so much. From all of that, like, I, I don't pay any of that any attention no more. Like, I'm just focused on the business and me developing and growing as a man. Great. And see, this is the vision that God had to give to you. Yes, ma'am. In yes, order for you to carry on with this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so ma what would you say to the other young men and women, the other entrepreneurs that are coming forth right now? I would say if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Like, I come from, I come from nothing. Like I come from, I come from nothing at all. Like I promise, if anybody can, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I just tell anybody, if if you just try, just even try. Like oh. I, I listen to a, what what one of the things that made me start doing it is I listened to one of Steve Harvey's uh, one of his quotes one time. Right. And me and my brother was just listening to it, and he was like, "If you're gonna do it, if you're gonna jump, go ahead and jump." So I, at the time I was working at Logan's mm -hmm. doing dishes, and I'm like, Shh, I'm finna, I'm finna jump, yes. <laughs> I'm finna jump, and I ain't, I ain't never looked back since. So like I said, man, it, it ain't I done been through so much, and like it's building my character, like it built right. my character. So mm -hmm. I look at it all as stepping stones. Like I learned from everything, and now I'm just putting it all, all of it into some positive, and doing something good, and it's actually working out for me. Well, I want you to know I'm so happy for you. Yes, ma'am. Thank and you. And I also want you to keep praying. Yes, ma'am. And have the faith. Yes, ma'am. Because nothing is impossible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Jordan I, Smith. Thank you all so time. much. You're more than welcome. Yes, Jordan. Thank you so much again. My guest today is Jordan Smith with the Love Seafood. One more time. What's that location, Jordan? It's 1211 Brick Church Pike. We're on the corner of Brick Church and Fern. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful yes, day. Yes, ma'am. You are too.
back again everyone thanks you are tuned in to another edition of in the know the jazzy radio magazine show that keeps you in the know about entertainment health food fashion lifestyles and community affairs and at this time we are turning the pages in the magazine back to our entertainment segment Charles Gray has performed on stage across the globe, from St. Petersburg, Russia, to Carnegie Hall, Broadway, Greece as Teen Angel, and The Color Purple as Mr. Old Mr. The Lion King as Mufasa and Scar. He's my guest today, Charles Gray. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very well. Good morning. It's fabulous to talk with you today. And you. <laughs> hey, tell us a little bit more about Charles Gray. I'm so impressed with your resume. <laughs> I wish my agents were. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, right now, honestly, I'm, my, my total focus is this show, and I'm just very excited to be a part of it. Uh-huh. I had um, made kind of an executive decision. I toured a lot early in my career, and it was great. It was a wonderful way to see the world and collect things and send them home. But at some point, I needed to just stop and be home with them, okay. you know? Um, so uh, this is kind of a return for me. I haven't I haven't toured in, in quite a few years. So um, all the stars lined up. It was the right people, the right project, the right role, and I was happy to say, why not, and jump aboard. So here we are. Oh, listen to the voice, everyone. I mean, come on, The Lion King. Tell me a little bit more about your role on The Lion King, Charles. Well, I covered both Mufasa and Scar. I did both of them a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and I had... And I had an ensemble track, so uh, it was it was by far the most physically taxing job I have ever had. There's really? no question about it. But it was also very exciting, um, you know, uh, working with uh, the genuine African cast and and being in such an amazing. Piece. It's one of those shows, you know, where you you watch something and you see it and you hear about it, but you never think that you'll actually be a part of it. <laughs> and there's I will never forget the very first time I got up there and and was doing Circle of Life, the opening number, and I just started crying. I was like, oh, my you God, I'm Lion King. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I cannot... It was so funny. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was a thrill. It, was, it, was, it really was. I, I've, I've been very fortunate to have some really uh, diverse and interesting jobs. I mean, I sang back up for Kubota Toshinobu in Japan. It was a huge Coca-Cola sponsored tour. Yeah. So I got to spend three and a half months going all over Japan, and I've traveled the world dance and a bunch of other things so I've, I've I've put my time in my goal for this particular tour actually is I've been to 49 of 50 states and during our break in LA I'm hoping to zip on down to Hawaii so that I can finish it off oh wow I can't believe that I'm actually speaking with you and your voice I mean Muf- Musafa right Mufasa Mufasa, Mufasa, Mufasa and, Scar. and Scar yeah. and then yeah, Mr. Mr. From the Color Purple, look at this. This yeah. is so exciting for me. I'm sorry. I'm blushing. <laughs> well, please, have, have fun. Have fun. I have to tell you that there's nothing like the opening night for the original Color Purple. Wow. The, I love it. I had never seen anything like it to be standing there, and you've got Tina Turner and Diane Sawyer oh, and Sidney wow. Poitier and, and, and Stevie Wonder and all these people mm-hmm. just everywhere. I mean, they're just like oh, just reach out and touch. There they are. Everybody was just, it was such an incredible experience and such amazing exposure. And, of course, the music it, it mm. finally got vindicated this time around on the second round. Yes, uh, and got, got the awards that it should have gotten the first time. Absolutely. It, 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 the score is phenomenal. Oh, yes. Yes, and it is. The, the talent was, was really just just really something. Like I said, I've, 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 I've been lucky. I've, I don't necessarily work every other week, but mm-hmm. when I get something, it's usually something good. And, and, <laughs> and, and look, you should keep something. I'm telling you, you are so talented, and it is such a pleasure to speak with you. But we're actually here to talk about the bodyguard that's coming to TPAC yes, here uh, next month. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about the bodyguard and what attracted you to being in it. Well, um, the music. Uh-huh. <laughs> the, yes. uh, the, I, I think it's just the general appeal. You know, um, if you're if you're looking from a performer's standpoint, um, frequently when we're ch- thinking about choosing projects, we want it's nice to have that project that gets 
amazing recognition um, on the level of, you know, an artistic achievement and all of that. That's lovely. Mm-hmm. But it's also nice to have a job that lasts long enough that you can enjoy it. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I can understand that. <laughs> you can get phenomenal reviews in close to three days, yes. or you can do something else that's actually going to last and mm-hmm. be impactful. Yeah. So uh, I saw this as, as a vehicle that I thought would definitely have a strong following. Uh, and the big kicker, obviously, for me was uh, Deborah Cox's involvement with absolutely. this because she is yes. just absolutely amazing. Yes, she is. And she is as wonderful a person as, as she sounds. Uh, there's nothing fake about her. She is, is, is just so genuine and so easy to work with. And it makes my job here mm-hmm. so much easier because uh, my role is Bill Devaney and I play her manager. Okay. And Bill's uh, sole purpose in life is to oversee and take care of her and her child, Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And um, it comes so naturally for me in this. I'm not having to really act because she's the kind of person that you just want to to reach out and and, um, embrace and and take care of. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's been a very organic uh, transition for me. Uh, wow. to come into this role. I wasn't sure, mm-hmm. quite honestly, why they had cast me for it initially, but once we all got in the room, it was so clear that we had been so well chosen because everybody's personality absolutely fits the role that they're doing. Oh, and see, that's very important, the connection. <laughs> Team connection yes. is so important. Yes, it is. Absolutely, Charlie. absolutely, and we get along surprisingly well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's been a very, very good experience, I have to say, so far. Good the audience has been... You know, we've done 90-odd shows. We've had 90-odd standing ovations. We've never done a show without a standing ovation. Wow. Um, you know, so I tend not to pay much attention to whatever the press is going through because the reality is we're very well sold and people love the show and they keep coming back and bringing their friends and they're having a great time. So I assume we're doing something right. Yeah, that's right. That's it. So keep doing what you're doing because it is absolutely right. Charles, <laughs> how is the musical version of The Bodyguard different from the movie, and what should audiences expect? Okay. Now, bear with me, because this is a pet peeve of mine. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> um, this is not, and I know, I know what everything says, but this is not a Whitney Houston tribute concert. Okay. This is a staged version of a movie that Whitney happened to have a role in. I see. Okay. So if we walk in with the expectation of seeing a staged version of a movie, as you would any other movie, Mm -hmm. I think you're going to be delightfully surprised. There are some twists and turns that have been, uh, some adjustments that have been made to the story that I think actually make it make a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, the music has been incorporated. Whitney's catalog has been incorporated into the storytelling in a way that makes you hear the song completely differently. Okay. Uh, I find that there's a lot of the songs that, you know, have just become standards and you hear it, you automatically start singing along with it in the grocery store. But we're really not paying attention to the words. And in, in the show, you get it. You get what all these songs are about. And, and they're beautiful. They really are. Yes, they so, are. So um, mm. I think I think it's a very enjoyable uh, evening. I think you know people will laugh. They'll be afraid. They'll be surprised. They'll see some really cool um, set and and special effects. And and it's 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 a big glitzy glamorous over the top thing. But you're gonna have fun. That's the bottom line. And I, I am think, looking I think forward to it. People will enjoy it. Yes, really. yes, Charles. I am looking forward to it. Coming to Nashville, everyone, on March 21st through the 26th, the Bodyguard. And I am on the we'll line. Yes, I'm on the lines with Charles Gray, uh, who's also performing in the show in the Broadway show. Charles, one more time, uh, tell us a little bit more about the Bodyguard. Well, I think everybody's going to have a wonderful time coming to it. It's um, we are. Deborah sings, literally sings 13 songs. Wow. Oh, I can't <laughs> um, wait. So I can't it, wait for it. It's a, it's a concert with everything that you could possibly wait. It's, it's a concert. It's a play. It's, it's a great evening. So just come, have some fun, and let us show you what we've got going on. 
You have been wonderful. Just do me one favor. Hey, this is In the Know, the Jazzy Radio Magazine show. Say a little bit something about it sounding like Mufasa. Yeah, a little bit something <laughs> like Mufasa. <laughs> I feel like I'm supposed to break out and he lives in you. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You're good. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much, I Charles. It. I won't put you on the spot, but I have really enjoyed speaking with you. And again, I'm looking forward to The Bodyguard, the musical coming to Nashville on March 21st through the 26th. Charles Gray, thank you so much. My pleasure. You, yeah. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. And again, listeners, um, just a great interview with Charles Gray. Just some more information about The Bodyguard. To play Nashville on March 21st through the 26th, The Bodyguard, the bodyguard tells the story of former Secret Service agent turned body, bodyguard Frank Farmer, who is hired to protect superstar Rachel Marin from an unknown stalker. And hopefully we'll uh, have um, Jasmine uh, Richardson on soon uh, due to unforeseen circumstances she was not able to be with us on today however charles gray uh was my guest to talk about the bodyguard again coming to nashville on march 21st through the 26th a grammy award nominee and r&b superstar deborah cox will star in this broadway musical Again, we have really, really enjoyed uh, my guest on today, and I want to send thanks out to them for being with me. And I want to say thanks to you, my loyal listeners, for listening to the show, tuning in to the station in general, RadioFreeNashville.org. Listen to us 24 hours a day. Really, really great programs on the station. And remember, um, social media with me. In the Know Radio Magazine Show, and that's on Facebook. And also Twitter, my handle there is ITK Radio Mag Show. And when we return, more of the show. We'll be right back with you. I win it all, it all falls down. I'm telling you.
are back, everyone. It has been a fabulous show. I have really enjoyed the show on today, and I hope you have as well. Make sure that you continue to follow me on social media in the No Radio Magazine show on Facebook and Twitter. That handle is ITK Radio Mag Show. It's prom time. The 12th annual Radio Free Nashville Birthday Bash is coming up on Sunday, April the 2nd, uh, and that's going to be at Yazoo Brewing, Brewing Company brewing company that's hard to say there uh <laughs> from 1 to 4 p.m live bands games and prizes and yazoo brew just contact us here at radiofreenashville.org or if you'd like to purchase a ticket contact myself um uh, it's been great, and I have enjoyed the show again. Um, and thanks to my guest on today. I hope you have enjoyed it as well. And make sure that you connect with me on face on Facebook and Twitter and also Radio Free Nashville as well. Maddie Rich, Daniel Glass, Rod Demery, Penny Johnson Gerald, Jordan Smith, and Charles Gray, my guests during the show today. It is Black History Month, so make sure you continue to celebrate in all ways that you can and acknowledge Black History Month. Hey, exciting show, and I hope you um, have a very, very blessed weekend and continue to tune in to the show and the station. And remember, if it's in the news, it's on In the Know Radio Magazine Show. <laughs>
Jonathan. I'm a big supporter of Radio Free Nashville. Tune in daily at 2 p.m. for Democracy Now!, the national daily independent award-winning news program hosted by journalist Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez. Democracy Now! provides access to people and perspectives rarely heard in the U.S. corporate-sponsored media, including independent and international journalists. Ordinary people from around the world who are directly affected by U.S. foreign policy, grassroots leaders and peace activists, artists, academics, and independent analysts. Hear the real debate weekdays at 2 on Democracy Now!, right here on Radio Free Nashville. Like a wild-